exile Surely it was true Since when has impossible Ever stopped you The Friday's disappointment The Sunday's empty tomb Since when has impossible Ever stopped you This is the sound of dry bones rattling This is the praise make a dead man walk again Open the grave, I'm coming out I'm gonna live, gonna live again This is the sound of dry bones rattling Before time began, he knew us. Destined to walk with him, talk with him, be loved by him, no words to describe. Nothing can measure the depths of his love. But in order to love him in return, we needed to be given a choice, free will. And in that free will, we chose wrong. We chose selfishly. Sin stained our hearts 
separating us from his presence. No matter how hard we tried to go back, we always came up short. Now, destined for eternal darkness, never able to restore what we broke. And when all hope seemed to be lost, God in his abounding love and mercy sent his one and only son to take our place on a cross to die for our sins. His name is Jesus. Stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never 
God knew there was only one way he could save us. So he sent his one and only son to be born a man. Trading his divinity for humanity. Raised by his own creation, the savior of the world now walked among us. When we saw a lost cause, he saw hope. When others ran away, he ran towards. Constantly doing the impossible. When we showed judgment, he showed mercy. Looking past our failures, beyond our brokenness, showing mercy and unconditional love. Jesus did not go after the healthy, but took care of the sick, bringing hope to the hopeless. Time after time, he performed miracles, healing the sick, raising the dead to life, showing us that through him, nothing is impossible with God. And as the final hour approached, he spent his last meal with friends, preparing them for a new way of life that could only come at a great cost.
sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Oh, yes, we do. We sing hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. See, that should have been me on that cross. It should have been us. But he ransomed himself for us. He paid our debt. Our debt should have been me on that cross. It is finished. Alone in my sorrow and in my sin, lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested my life began Nash was redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet and my fear rose to death when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you 
Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt. So it was finished. Jesus took the punishment of the world upon himself and came back three days later with our freedom in hand, closing the separation between us and God, now permitted in his presence to once again walk with him, talk with him, have a relationship with him, and spend eternity with him. All he asks of you is 
to believe. So here's the big question. Do you believe? Trust me when I say this, nobody was expecting a resurrection. Uh, not the people closest to Jesus, not his enemies, not even those who he had performed miracles on. I mean, nobody that morning on Easter morning was standing outside of the tomb, counting down from 10. Everybody expected Jesus to do really what all deceased people do, and that's, well, stay deceased. Matter of fact, in um, John's account of this, he shows the first people that would show up uh, to the tomb. It was a group of women. And I'm going to read this, and, and, and you tell me if this looks like they believed that a resurrection uh, was going to occur. It says this. This is John 20, verse 1 through 2. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Now does that sound like they thought a resurrection had occurred? Absolutely not. They didn't even expect to show up at the tomb and the stone be rolled away and the tomb be empty. And then what happened next is we see over in Luke's account, when all the disciples heard what happened, heard that uh, he had been risen, that he rose from the dead, uh, let's look at their words and just you tell me what you think. This is Luke chapter 24, verse 11. It says this, But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. And who could blame them? I wouldn't, nor would you. Yet here we stand today, uh, and the life of Jesus has influenced more art, more architecture, uh, more music than any other topic in the world. Even more amazingly, here we are today, 2,000 years later, and what started out of a group of 12 uh, men following Jesus has now turned into worldwide 2.3 billion people are followers of Jesus. 2.3 billion people uh, profess that Jesus is the Son of God and that He offers us a better life here on earth, but also offers us forgiveness of sins and an eternal life when this life's over. Now, how could something grow to be something so big from something so small? Was it because of His teaching? Was it because of uh, the miracles He performed? No. It was because of the resurrection. See, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what proves everything else that He taught everything else that he said about this life and the life after uh, this life's over. If there were no resurrection, I wouldn't follow Jesus. And I don't know if 2.3 billion people would follow Jesus as well. But because of the resurrection, it changed the world and it has the power of changing your world as well. Maybe you're here today and uh, you're a believer and you're here to celebrate the resurrection and you know firsthand uh, what all God has done in your life. Or maybe perhaps you're here and you grew up in church and eventually you got out and Maybe your story is one of those who your grandparents or your parents, you know, made you go to church all the time. And your experience of religion uh, was just based off of what mom and dad uh, believed and what they told you to believe. And um, you perhaps grew up and had questions, you know, about the, uh, you know, stories in the Bible. And, and they gave you a statement to answer all your questions. Really, they said, if the, the Bible says it, you believe it. And hey, you did for a little while. But then you began to wonder as you grew up, can I believe the things they told me to believe? Or perhaps you find yourself in a third group, and that's the group that just uh, is unchurched. Or maybe you don't even go to church at all, or maybe you never tried the religion thing, and, and you would consider yourself an unbeliever. And you're not you know, anti-God, or you're not uh, mad at God, um, but you just think logically, I, I just don't know if I can wrap my mind around um, Jesus rising from the dead. Is there any proof behind this? And if there is, well, um, what does that mean for me personally? And I want to tell you, if you find yourself in that group, thank you so much for hanging out with me for just a few moments today. And I want to tell you that the resurrection of Jesus Christ might just be the most important thing that you will ever investigate for yourself. C.S. Lewis said it once this way, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. See, I happen to believe this, that everybody is betting their afterlife on something. Everybody. And we would all be fools to go through life unprepared for what will eventually happen. 
See, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what sets Christianity apart from every other religion. The Easter story is what validates everything else that Jesus said about this life and the next life. And if true, and it is true, it means this for us today, that what you believe about the resurrection of Jesus Christ has absolutely everything to do with where you will spend eternity. And that ought to make us listen to the Easter story just a little bit closer than ever before because, well, so much is at stake. So for just a few moments today, we're going to talk about just only two things. Number one, we're going to talk about the proof of the resurrection. And then we're going to talk about the purpose of the resurrection in what I believe to be the greatest love story ever told. Throughout history, there's some great love stories. Um, the classic Romeo and Juliet that we grew up reading in grammar school or perhaps in the next, you know, this generation, the, the movie, The Notebook or The Titanic. Um, but I can tell you emphatically that there has never been a greater love story than a love story of Jesus' death and resurrection. The most quoted verse in all of the Bible shows us God's love for us. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So loved. You know what that means? That means that God didn't just love the cosmos that He created, the, the trees, the water, the animals. It means that He loves all the world because He loves each individual in the world. It means that despite your sins, despite your mess-ups, despite your failures, that God is so in love with you. It means that He can love you no less in this moment. It means that He can love you no more than He does in this moment. It means that He is literally in love with you so much so that if you were the only human being on planet Earth, that God would have sent His Son to still come on a cross and die for you. That's how much He loves you. Now you're probably thinking, what kind of God would send His own Son to die on a cross? I want to tell you what kind of God. A loving God. A God that loves you so much that He knew that sin had wrecked this relationship that He desired. And the only way to reconcile that would be by sending His Son Jesus to be all God, all man, and live a sinless, perfect life on our behalf and then go to a cross and die on a cross uh, in our place as us and for us. And on that cross, Holy God the Father poured out His anger, His wrath, His hatred, His judgment towards my sin because He's holy. And He created us for a relationship, but He cannot have a relationship now with sinful mankind and this broke His heart. And He pours out this wrath and anger, something I deserved, onto His own Son. And His own Son is not a victim, but a volunteer. And He lays down His life for us. And He took what I deserve for my sins in the sight of Holy God. And then He went to a grave and He didn't remain there, but He rose from the grave. If Jesus would have stayed on the cross, can I tell you, if He would have remained on the cross, um, his claims to being the Son of God would be invalid. Uh, it wouldn't have been enough. See, the purpose of Easter, the purpose of the resurrection is to prove, in fact, that He is the Son of God, to prove His love for us and to prove that He and He alone can offer us forgiveness of sins and eternal life when this life is over. That's the purpose of the Easter story. But what about for some of you that say, you know, I just need a little bit more proof that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Well, if that's you, you've probably heard a couple of myths uh, surrounding the Easter story. You know, you probably heard the myth that the disciples uh, stole the body. Um, this was a rumor actually recorded for us in Matthew's gospel. And here's how that rumor got started, by the way. Here's what Matthew chapter 28, 12 through 13 says. When the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night, stole the body away while we were asleep. But this theory, even though it's recorded in uh, Matthew's gospel, how this rumor began that the disciples, you know, stole the body, even if we didn't have this scripture, common sense would tell us that this is just not possible. Here are Roman guards who are trained soldiers who would be burned alive if they had fell asleep on a job, now watching over the tomb of Jesus, and you're going to tell me that a, a group of a group of fishermen, a, a tax collector, is going to come and, and get by two Roman soldiers? These are not UFC fighters. These are not special forces. It's a tax collector. It's a few fishermen. And, and you're going to tell me that they would now go and get by two trained Roman soldiers 
and, and, and move a 2,000 pound stone that was rolled down an incline in front of uh, the tomb there, it, it just doesn't make logical sense. These were not courageous men. These were men when Jesus was arrested that they all ran. They all thought they were going to be next. And how are you going to tell me that they got past two Roman soldiers um, to get to a body of a dead man? I mean, think about it. They ran when he was alive. If the disciples wouldn't risk their lives for Jesus when he was alive, they certainly wouldn't risk their lives to create a lot. There would be no intent. Think about it. When Jesus died, everything died with him. He said that he was the, the, the son of God. Uh, the son of God doesn't die. He told the disciples he was the resurrection. The resurrection doesn't die. So when he died to the disciples, everything he said died as well. So there would be no intent behind this theory. Now you've probably heard the second theory surrounding the resurrection. And that's this one. That the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, is just a myth. It's just a, a, a fictional story. It's just a legend. Well, the problem with this theory is, is many problems, but for starters, there's people that devote their entire lives to studying how legends or myths uh, form and how they grow. And every single one of them will tell you it takes between 50 to 90 years for a legend to form. And here's why it takes so long. It takes so long because all of the eyewitnesses have to die out first before people can rally around and make this bigger than it should be because all the truth, the people that were eyewitnesses, are now gone. And so this theory doesn't work when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ because the interesting thing about this theory is if you were to try to apply it to the resurrection of Jesus is this. Christianity grew not after all the eyewitnesses died, but because of eyewitnesses. You see, less than two months later, after Jesus has rose from the dead, the church was launched, and we see in one particular incident that 3,000 people joined the church. History tells us this. Historians tell us this. Even non-Christian historians validate that this is the way that Christianity grew because of all the eyewitnesses. To add to this theory too, though, think about this. The stories of Jesus are not written uh, like a legend, like a myth. They're not written like a fictional story. It's written too much like eyewitnesses documented it. I mean, if this was a uh, fictional story, this is the first thing that I would not have done. I would not have written this story if I wanted people to believe this. I would not have written that the first people to see the tomb empty were women. And now here's why. In this culture, in this day, in this era, women were not valid eyewitnesses in the court of law or anywhere. And so if you wanted to write a story that you wanted other people to believe, you would not have wrote it with women being the first one at the scene of the tomb. Now, here's why they wrote in that women were the first to see the empty tomb because women were the first to see the empty tomb. It reads too much like truth. Also, when someone writes a fictitious story, um, they, the writer tends to write themselves in a little bit more heroic than they really were. In the Gospels, we look and they're, they're you know, writing themselves in as cowards. They're writing themselves in as people, when Jesus was arrested, that, that they all ran, that they eventually locked themselves behind you know, closed doors. It reads too much like truth for this theory to hold up. Now, here is the evidence that shows us that the Easter story is, in fact, believable. The first piece of evidence is the empty tomb. You can go to the graves of any great leader that's ever existed, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, Abe Lincoln, and you could dig up those bones if you wanted to, and the bones would still be there, not Jesus. On the third day, he rose, and the tomb has been empty ever since. Look what happened on that day. This is Luke's gospel, chapter 24, verse 2 through 7 in Luke's gospel. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothes. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while you were still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified and on the third day rise again? Evidence of the empty tomb. Now the second piece of evidence that's interesting is this, the evidence of eyewitnesses. The evidence of eyewitness in the court of law 
takes priority. The amount of uh, eyewitness evidence surrounding the, the life of Jesus and his resurrection is absolutely astonishing. Uh, it in itself makes this story hard not to believe. Um, in the historical documents that the guy named uh, Paul wrote, the Apostle Paul, uh, we call it 1 Corinthians, and it eventually uh, ended up in our Bibles. He used to be a non-believer that Jesus was, in fact, the, the Messiah until he ran into Jesus after Jesus was supposed to be dead. He actually has an interesting account here, and look what his account says. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5 through 6. He said, And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some had fallen asleep. Here's Paul saying to the people that those days, Many people saw him for over a month. Don't believe me? Go ask them. They're still alive. It's not just because it's in our Bibles that we believe it. It's so much better than that. It's in our Bibles because so many eyewitnesses saw it and documented it for us. Matthew saw it and saw Jesus after the resurrection and documented it for us. John saw him crucified, saw him after the resurrection, hung out with him afterwards and documented it for us. Peter, the same thing. The most fascinating eyewitness of all of them to me is James, the brother of Jesus. Think about it. James, the brother of Jesus, never believed that Jesus was the Son of God, never believed that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah, until James, the brother of Jesus, had an encounter with his brother, Jesus, after his brother had rose from the dead. And only then did his own brother believe, in fact, that Jesus was the Messiah. I love the way that Pastor Andy Stanley says it. He says, what would it take for your brother to convince you that he's the son of God? <laughs> Think about it. Only one way. You'd have to, to, to know him, live around him, uh, do his funeral, and then three days later, him come and want to take you out for coffee. Okay. And so the third thing that we're going to see when we talk about evidence, proof surrounding the resurrection of Jesus Christ and this is one that makes the Easter story very believable as well. It's the evidence of life change and the disciples. The evidence of life change. They had more than just head knowledge about Jesus. When they realized who Jesus was after the re resurrection, they had drastic life change. We all know people that's found Jesus and their life has drastically changed because of it. The evidence surrounding life change of the disciples is amazing. They were transformed uh, from the inside out. Look at Peter. Peter was a guy who said, I'll never deny you. And the night Jesus was arrested, uh, he ran away like, like a coward. And then after the resurrection, Peter stands in front of thousands of people, many of them who were the ones there yelling, crucify Jesus, crucify. And he boldly tells them, say you're sorry, repent, and be baptized. And they did. See the big life change there with Peter? Or what about Paul? Paul was an unbeliever that Jesus was the Messiah until he ran into Jesus after Jesus was supposed to be dead. And Paul was a guy who relied on religion and relied on his good works to make him right and good enough in the eyes of God. He followed the law perfectly. And when he met Jesus, Here's Paul to begin to not rely on his own works, but to rely fully on Jesus' finished works. Look what he says over in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. He says this, God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Here's Paul that had a drastic life change because of an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Or John. John was one of the closest followers of Jesus. And at one time, John was a, a hardcore fisherman who was rough and rugged and self-centered. And he had a hot temper. He was one of the sons of thunder. But yet after an encounter, a real personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus, here's John who used to be hot tempered, but now he would write the epistle of love. The book of John, all about God's love for us. Or how about Thomas? We know Thomas in the Bible is Doubting Thomas. He was the one that said, I will not believe unless I see it for myself. I will not believe unless I put my fingers in the holes in his hands and, and touch his side. But Doubting Thomas, after an encounter with the resurrected Jesus, would go on and boldly 
take the gospel into India, some of the most brilliant minds and philosophers of their day, and here is Doubting Thomas who would boldly stand in front of them and proclaim who Jesus was and what he saw. You remember Thomas, when he was standing there and touched Jesus and saw Jesus after Jesus rose from the dead, you remember Jesus' words to him? He said this, John chapter 20, verse 29, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see and yet believed. And finally, what makes the story very, very, very compelling and easy to believe is the evidence of the way that the disciples died. The disciples did not die because of what they believed. The disciples died believing what they had seen, a resurrected Jesus. They refused to deny that they had saw Jesus rise from the dead, even when faced with death. Almost all the disciples and the apostles died deaths that were brutal, but yet refused to deny Christ. Philip, Simon, Jude, and Peter were crucified yet they never wavered. They died believing who they had seen, Jesus resurrected. James, the brother of Jesus, was thrown off a temple. He was beaten to death by clubs, but he never wavered. He died believing his brother was in fact his Lord. Matthew, Paul, James, uh, Matthias, all of them were beheaded believing what they had seen. Nathaniel was uh, whipped repeatedly until he bled out and died. And all he had to do, all he had to do is just say, stop. It was all a lie, but he couldn't because he knew what he had seen. And he had knew the moment that he breathed his last breath, that he will be once again face to face with his Lord. Thomas, remember doubting Thomas? Thomas was stabbed to death by spears. John, one of the closest friends of Jesus, he ends his historical document saying this, and these are some powerful words for us today. John chapter 20, verse 31. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Probably one of my favorite Bible verses because here's what's cool. Here is John who was an eyewitness to all these things we talked about today. Writing in his documentation, I've written these things so that you may believe. Now, who's you? I mean, John didn't know if his document was going to last a week, a month, a couple of years. But yet here you and I are 2,000 years later. And here's John's words that resonate with us today. I've written these things that I understand are going to be, seem so hard to believe, but I've written them. I was there. I was an eyewitness. And the reason I written, written them was so that you may believe and have eternal life and have life in his name. We started out today with that question. Do you believe? And that's a question that we all must answer at some point. Everybody's betting their lives on something. Now, after hearing the facts surrounding the resurrection, what are you betting your life on? If you'd like to have Jesus in your life, if you'd like to have forgiveness of sins and eternal life after this life's over, all you've got to do is just by faith accept everything that he's ever done. All you've got to do is call out to him and say, I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a savior. And I believe that Jesus is Lord. If you'd like to have eternal life, forgiveness of sins and a relationship, I want to lead you in a prayer where you can do so right now. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes as we go to the Lord in prayer together? Father, thank you so much for today. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you have opened the eyes of many people about the truth of who you are and what you came to offer them. I pray that you would give courage to those people today that you are knocking on the doors of their hearts Lord, to just open that and to invite you in. So if you'd like to have Christ in your life today, just simply say this prayer in your heart silently and you just believe on it with everything you've got. Are you ready? Say, Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I cannot save myself. So right here, right now, I repent of my sins. I am sorry for my sins. I believe that your son Jesus died on a cross for me in my place. And I believe that your son Jesus rose from the dead. So today by faith, the best way I know how, come into my life and save me. I'll never be ashamed of you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
Now, if you just gave your life to God, we are so excited for you. If you're watching by way of technology, I want to let you know there's a number on the screen right now. Would you do me a big favor and text me and let me know about your decision? I want to send you some content to get you started out right in your Christian journey. We love you and we hope that you have a blessed Easter.